I have a story to tell you. This happened many years ago at a Christian college far away from here. A student from the New Testament survey class that I was teaching at that time uh, came to my office hours. And after some pleasantries, he quoted John 3.16, and he began to share the gospel. And I quickly realized I was being evangelized. <laughs> it was an endearing moment, because I admired this young man for his courage and his concern. But as we continued to talk, I began to realize that this was a conversation that was about his faith, and his faith that was feeling a little bit rattled at that moment. Now, that might be understandable, because after all, we were talking about the synoptic problem in the Gospels in class that week, and this was probably his first exposure to academic biblical studies. And he was really having trouble believing that anybody who would teach that stuff was truly a believer and follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I shared with him a little bit of my testimony, how I became a Christian, made an adult commitment to Christ between my junior and senior years of college, when friends had given me two things to read over the summer. One was Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth, and the other was a tract of the Gospel of John in a new translation, the NIV, which has become very close to my heart. So Lindsay put the fear of God in me, and the Gospel of John reminded me that Jesus loves me. I remember then how spiritually important college years are, and it's been such a great privilege that God has given me to spend so much of my life ministering to students in college. And I remember how important it is that as, as young people leave their parents' home, that they have an opportunity to embrace the Christian faith as their own, as a young adult. So I explained to my student how important it was for him while he was at a Christian college, to engage the hard questions about God and the Bible and Christian faith. I want my students to leave my classroom with a faith they can continue to grow into, and not a faith that they're going to grow out of the first time somebody challenges their beliefs intellectually. I wanted him to hear the hard things about the Bible from me and his other professors while we could help him think them through. Now after, I don't know, maybe 10 years after, 10, 12 years after I graduated from college, the Lord called me to seminary. That was a very confusing time in my life. I was well situated in a career in computer science. I had gotten my master's degree, and I had worked as a software engineer at Princeton University's plasma physics lab, where I met my husband, and then later in uh, systems management at the Institute for Advanced Study. But more importantly, I didn't know one other Christian woman who had any kind of Christian ministry or calling in her own right. And one thing I did know, the Lord was not calling my husband to be a pastor. He was a senior research physicist and a believer at Princeton. So it took us about two years to think and pray this through. And when I finally started seminary, I adopted as, as one of my life verses, Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Even back then, I knew that being an evangelical woman in biblical studies was going to have its challenges, and brother, was I right. So I'd like to share with you today, as an older sister, much older sister in Christ, just three things, very briefly, that I have learned about living worthily for the, for the Lord while writing three of my academic books. And if anything is of particular interest to you, 
you can go check the book out of the library. I've put the, the title on the bottom of the slide. Now, the first book I wrote, other than my doctoral dissertation, was a commentary on the book of Esther. And probably Esther 4.14 is the most famous verse from that book, where Mordecai asks Queen Esther, who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this? Well, how did Esther come to her royal position? You probably remember the story. Esther, a nice Jewish girl, was taken into the harem of the Persian king Xerxes to compete in his new queen beauty contest. And she apparently played to win because he preferred her over all the other young women. And he crowned her queen of Persia. About that same time, a great threat arose against Esther's people because of the evil Haman who had convinced the king to allow a genocide of the Jews in Persia. And Mordecai, Esther's cousin, implored her to do something. But you see, there was a problem. And the problem was, Esther hadn't quite gotten around to owning up to her religious identity as a Jew. She was living in a way that, in fact, the king and the court had no idea that she was Jewish. And so Mordecai begs her, Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now, you remember, may remember that the story of Esther is notorious because it doesn't mention God even once. And there are no miracles in it, not even a tiny one. But back at Sinai, when God had made a covenant to preserve and protect his people, he accomplished that in this case by bringing Esther to her royal position without miracles and without a great display of power, but through the ordinary events of her life. In other words, what theologians call divine providence. But the defining moment is when Esther decides to own her covenant relationship with God, even at great risk to herself. And that set into motion a series of events that delivered the Jewish people from annihilation. Now, although there's not one tiny miracle in the book of Esther, the, the story and the cumulative results of a series of improbable events leads us to ponder the miraculous quality of the ordinary, of how God is always at work in history and in our lives to accomplish his perfect purposes to live worthily as a follower of Jesus, own your identity of who you are in Christ at every decision point, every day, every decision, and trust God to providentially unfold your life before you. This isn't your parents' faith anymore. This is a faith that needs to become yours as you move into adulthood. A second lesson I learned about living worthily for the Lord grew out of my academic work on the book of First Peter. I was writing an exegetical commentary when First Peter 2, 19 through 21, stopped me dead in my tracks. Peter writes, it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, 
because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. What? What's the grammatical antecedent of the demonstrative pronoun, this? We're called to endure suffering for doing good? Didn't Jesus suffer so I don't have to? Doesn't vicarious atonement mean vicarious suffering? So I put down my pen, so to speak. For about a month, it took me to think and pray through what the Lord was trying to tell us through the Apostle Peter. Now, when Peter wrote those words, Christians were being persecuted for their faith by their society. And Peter's point is that it should not surprise his readers if they experience persecution and hardship because of their faith, if God wills it. But you and I live in a time and place where we're enjoying life in what at least once was a predominantly Christian culture. And most of us have never experienced what Peter's readers originally, his original readers, were facing. But you know, I fear that that's rapidly changing in our times. And that your generation of the church must be prepared to face social ostracism and forms of persecution that my generation never had to face. But that got me thinking, even in times when we're living free of persecution, is there a sense in which we are called to suffer for Jesus Christ, to suffer for doing good? Now, you might remember that Jesus rebuked Peter, the one who wrote 1 Peter 2, 19 through 21. Jesus rebuked Peter in Mark 8 and its parallels and then said that whoever wished to follow Jesus must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow in his footsteps. To follow Jesus means self-denial. And self-denial hurts. Simply put, God wills for us to suffer self-denial rather than to sin to suffer for doing good, to suffer for doing the right thing. You see, I used to think that the powerful temptation of sin was pleasure. But after I studied 1 Peter, I concluded that I think we sin to avoid suffering. We take the easy way out, the path of least resistance, Think about it, you could probably think of a hundred examples, but think about why would a student cheat on a test? It's not for the pleasure of it. Isn't it to avoid facing the consequences of failure? Avoid suffering that consequence? Why is there so much sexual immorality in our society? Isn't it because people are unwilling to suffer with unmet desires and needs? When we want something, anything, that we can't have unless we sin to get it, then the Lord expects us to deny ourselves and to suffer rather than to sin. You have been called to deny yourself, to live worthily for the Lord, even if that means suffering for doing the right thing. The third lesson about living worthily came from writing my book on John's letters. In 1 John, John wrote, anyone who loves God must love their brother and sister. Love for God means love for other people. It's all about living worthily of the gospel in our relationships, every day, in every situation. Something I might add has been woefully, grievously missing from some of the incidents recently on campus. 
But one day, when I was teaching this in class, a student just about jumped out of his seat, and he's waving his hand, Dr. Jobes, how can God expect me to love somebody I don't even like? What a good question. The answer hangs on the definition of love. And love is one of the most distorted and abused and misused concepts in our society today. We grow up thinking of love as an emotion, as some greater degree than liking. But do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told? When somebody asked him, when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, and somebody said, well, who's my neighbor? And he tells this story of the Good Samaritan, where he defines love as meeting the need of someone, even if it's someone we don't like even if it's someone we'd love to hate. The Jews and the Samaritans loved to hate each other at that time. And yet Jesus defined both neighbor and love by pointing to a Samaritan who stopped to take care of a Jewish stranger who was in great need, and it was at the Samaritan's great expense and inconvenience. So John writes in 1 John, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The expression of our love for God is not determined by how long we pray, or how often we go to church, as important as those things are to practice uh, the faith, we express our love for God by caring for the life needs of others. Doesn't matter what we do, how many books we write, how many degrees we get, how much money we make, what really matters is how we treat other people, how we respond to the needs of others, that we live worthily of the gospel in our relationships with one another. You must love others if you dare to claim that you love God. My young friends, there's a lot more I could tell you about what the Lord has taught me over decades about living worthily. Academic study of the Bible is not opposed to a vibrant evangelical faith. In fact, academic study of the Bible grounds the church and our lives more deeply in Christ. The church needs scholarship to achieve its mission. And Christ raises up in every generation women and men called to do the hard work of learning the, the ancient languages and spending their lives in biblical and theological studies. He's no doubt calling some of you here today to be a, a servant scholar in your generation of the church. But whatever future you're preparing for, while you're here at Wheaton, learn to love the Lord with your mind. Learn to live worthily of the gospel of Christ at every decision point, in every relationship for Christ and his kingdom. Pray with me. Our Lord, we thank you for your calling in our lives, as varied and as they may be. And we pray that your word indeed would be a light to our path for all of our lives. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a safe and happy spring break. You're dismissed. <laughs>